All right. Um, accidentally, actually, you know, last week recording, I recorded as, uh, you know, chapter 41 through 44, but I realized that we only cover up to chapter 43, not 44. So that was a mistake. So we're going to cover chapter 44 today. read the scripture but now hear O Jacob my servant Israel whom I have chosen though says the Lord who made you who formed you from the womb and will help you fear not O Jacob my servant Jezreel whom I have chosen for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground I will pour my spirit upon your offsprings and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord's of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it, let him declare, and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witness. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know, not any. All who fashion idols are nothing, and... The things they delight is not a do not profit. Their witness neither see nor know, that they may be put to shame, who fashion a god of cast an idol that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame. And, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tools and works it over the coals. He fashioned it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carp carpet nurse stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and makes it with the compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man. With the beauty of a man, to dwell in the house, he cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak. Let it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it became fuel for a man. He takes a part it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and uh, bakes bread. Also, he makes a, go a god and worship it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it, it burns it in, in the fire. Over the half, he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and say, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into God he, his idols and falls down to it and worship it. He prays it to it and says, that Deliver me, for you are my God. They, they know not nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their uh, hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned it in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make this rest of, rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Redeemers, these things of Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. 
Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shut a depth of the, of the earth. Break forth into spring, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Though says the Lord, your redeemers, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrated the signs of liars and makes a fool of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the words of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Who says to the deep, Be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Um, as I mentioned you know, from the last a couple of sessions that we talked about, um, God spoke to Isaiah in the time when there is no war and when there is no um, the attacks coming from either um, the Babylonians or or any of those uh, the strong countries. Well, of course, they have seen the uh, the invasion from. Uh, Assyria um, here there but all this prophecy was given to Isaiah um, when things were okay and uh, the time when Isaiah was you know prophesizing to the people of Israel as you have you know seen in the past people did not pay attention to the prophet's message nor the God's message at all but when you look at the message here just I want you to just look at it from God's perspective not from our perspective what's really important is understanding you know when he speaks to his messages how he how is he feeling for Israel I want you to put yourself in his shoes and look at it and think about it from his perspective. So let's just take a look at the, the verse here. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Israel did not choose God. God chose them. It is not like they just came to the Lord and choose me, choose me. That's not what Israel did. God chose them. Why did, why did God choose them? Because they were nothing. Because they're, they're small. Because they're incapable of doing anything. And continue on. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. They didn't ask for help. God is the one who's saying, I am going to help you. So, even though people of Judah did not listen to God or follow God's teaching, God is the one, He just keeps saying, I formed you, I will help you, I will just be with you, and He's the one who just keeps saying this. And Israel is saying, like, we don't need you. We're going to do it on our own things, and I'm going to worship other idols. I don't need your help. But God is the one who's so anxious that he wants to really tell them that I, I am your God. I am going to help you. And verse 3 says, um, For I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon your offsprings and my blessing on your descendants. And obviously, for us, we know it is fulfilled. When the time when Jesus Christ died and resurrected, and he poured his spirit on the people like us. They shall spring up 
among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This is the some things that we are enjoying it. And anyone who actually born after Jesus Christ, we're the one who's actually enjoying those blessings. Of course, Isaiah was actually giving the double prophecy that God is actually going to help you and in Israel at the time, but it is actually telling us when this will be fulfilled, which is the time after Jesus Christ. The one will say, I am the Lord's, another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. So, he claimed himself, I am the Lord's, another will call on the name of the Jacob, another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. And he claims himself, Though says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. What is he claiming? He's claiming, I am the only God. There is no other God. Why? Because everybody at the time of Israel and Judea, people claiming there is a many gods because they were worshiping God and other idols at the same time. Just to keep that in mind, it's not like they did not worship the Lord. It did not. They did not bring the, uh, you know, uh, the animals to the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord. But not only they were worshiping the Lord, they were worshiping others as well. Why were they actually worshiping other gods while they were worshiping you know, the Lord? It's very simple. From their perspective, I don't care which God gives me what I need. I'm just going give it, to give it to all these gods, and whoever gives me, then I'm happy. If all gods give me the blessing, I'm great. So, God was not the uh, only God that they served, but they, the Lord was one of those Lord, uh, the God that they were worshipping. So, um, from God's perspective, you could think of it this way. There's a woman. This woman serving five different men. And saying, whoever provides me the food and the clothes and what I need, I'm happy to get it. It doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be all five, but five will be the, you know, the best scenario. But even if two or three gives me what I need, I'm good enough. Then I want you to look at it from two different perspectives. One is from the woman's perspective. The other is from the man's perspective. I want you to put yourself in woman's perspective and I want you to put yourself in the man's perspective. How would you feel? Woman's perspective, when you look at it, she will be fulfilled for the things that she needs. Right? She just trying to just to like get what she needs. Which is, you know, from her perspective, it makes sense. But when you look at it from the man's perspective, you are being used to fulfill what she needs. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be those one of those five guys. Right? I really don't. And God was treated just like that. They were treating God as just one of those gods, one of many. So, there's, there are a few countries... It's very difficult to evangelize. One of those countries is Japan. You can actually preach the Japanese about Christianity and preaching about the gospel. They will accept the gospel. They're, they're welcome to receive. But you know what? They're going to accept the gospel and Jesus as one of many God they serve. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, a Japan, or if, if you know Japan, there's a lots of assurance. Everything is God. 
everywhere is assured. So many, there's a, there are so many festivals and festivity they attend. And what they do is they put a little piece of, uh, you know, wishes and then they put it on there and they're wishing for whatever they want, right? And then wh wherever they actually see the shirin, they go and then they put those wishes, then they pray. Why are they doing it? Because the more they do, the more God they giving the blessings to them is all they want. They have no regards for God. All they care about me, my blessing, my, you know, peace is all they care about. God never wants to be treated like that. But Israel was treating the God the way they were treating any other gods. So this is why he claims himself strongly the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. He's making very bold statements. There is no other God. Whatever you're worshiping, they're not God. I am the only God. Remember, when God actually pulled the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, and when he poured the ten plagues in the land of Egypt, and every single time when actually God brought the disaster upon the land of Egypt, what was the claim that Moses gave to the uh, pharaohs and Egyptians? Do you remember what that was? Let's actually go to uh, Exodus for a second. Let's say... Um, Exodus chapter 6. We're going to read from um, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burden of Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for uh, possessions. I am the Lord. Moses spoke those to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So what did God tell Moses? I am the Lord. I am the God. Through these disasters and through these uh, plagues that you know God brought upon the land of Egypt, He was uh, strongly teaching Pharaohs, Egyptians, and Israelites, and the people who hears these news, to know, Lord is the God. That's the point that God was trying to teach everyone. 
And that's why God actually showed the miraculous signs and wonders and all these things that everyone knows that He is the Lord. He's been doing this from the beginning. The creation of this world is when he started to teach the man, he is the Lord, he is the God. But look at the histories. And look at where they are today. God is keep teaching people, I am the Lord. No matter how many times that he's been actually teaching the man, he is a God. And even until today, people still don't believe. No matter what God showed, no matter what he did, he, 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 he himself came down, right? But the man crucified him on the cross. So no matter what God does, people are so corrupted that they don't believe that God is the only God. So he's proclaiming, he's proclaiming with the very, you know, saddened heart. I am telling you, I am the Lord. But people don't believe it. So you have to look at it from God's perspective. He's been doing this for over and over and over for hundreds and thousands of years. No matter what he does, people still don't believe. It only selected people believe. So this is the kind of things that you need to see and, 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 and understand God's heart. How he feels. If you don't know God's heart, you will not going to understand why he says what he says, why he does what he does. If you only look at it from the Israelites' perspective, and if you only look at it from our own perspective, you will never going to understand God's heart and why he's doing what he's doing, why he wrote the things the way he wrote. It is very important that you need to stand from the God's perspective. This is something I mentioned in the past. There's two sides of the view. When you read the Bible, you need to look at it from God's perspective, not from our perspective. Because the Bible is written such that God is speaking to us from His heart. And if you don't look at it from his heart, his part, you're not going to understand. So this is the kind of things that you may feel. And as a parent, you know, if you're not parents, you may not actually feel, you know, this, uh, this, that, that hard. But when we speak to our children and when we actually say something because of a love, they don't always accept the way I want to present it to them. Many times we say something and they usually respond, enough, I heard enough, right? Because we just tend to keep repeat ourselves many times, right? Because we're telling them, because with love, we want them to go to the right path. We're telling them, reminding them, do this. But the way they perceive, the way they receive our message is just, Nothing more than a just too much of, you know, uh, instructions. The child does not understand parents' heart until they become a parent themselves. One day, when they become a parent, they will understand. Just like we understand a lot more about our parents after we became a parent because we go through the very similar process that our parents had gone through. You know, the, the funny part is, you know, I tell my children about the things that I say, right, instruct them. But you know what? When I look back and I just pause myself and I think, did I, did I do this to my parents? When I think about it, most likely I have done the same thing to my parents. 
they were trying to do this the same thing to me that with the all the love and tr they try to just to give the right instructions and but you know what i wasn't really listening to my parents i just did what i wanted it right same thing until we feel until we experience we don't know what it's like god's heart is the same thing god is claiming i am the lord there is no other god and it says who is like me let him proclaim it let him declare and set it before me so you can you can see the tones of God, how frustrated he is. There is no God. If there is, bring, bring it forth. If there is one, bring it to me. Can we bring to prove? No. So he's making very bold a statement and said, if you know if there is any other God, bring it forth. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. So what God is saying, yeah, if you think there is another God, bring it forth. And let, you know, let that God tell us what happened in the past and tell us and show us what will happen in the future. No one will. So he's making this claim. But listen to what he's saying. He's a very, very frustrated with people of Judah. And you have to understand his frustrations and his painful heart, why he's actually saying what he's saying. Just like you're, we as a parent are saying to our children, is there anyone who loves you more than me? Bring it forth. Right? I love you. This is why I'm saying this to you. And then what is the response from your child? They're scolding like, huh? Yeah, you love me, of course. Yeah. They don't understand. This is the kind of things that you need to really understand. So, in my opinion, all Christians must be married and have a child and go through the very similar experience. Once we actually go through this experience, you would understand God's heart much better. This is one of the reasons why God gave us a family so that we understand His heart better. And he says, fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from, the, from of old and declared it? And you are my witness. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. So he's just making the statement, there is no God. If there, if there is a God, then think about it from his perspective. If we can prove there is an other God, we're making him a liar. You lied. There is other God besides you. Then he become a liar. Right? If we can prove there, if there is another God. So he's actually, he's actually telling us, if there is any God, bring it to me. And I'm making sure there is no other God. So, if you look at it from this perspective, either he's lying or he's t telling us the truth. So there's, there's nothing in between. Either he's telling us the truth or he's telling us a lie. Right? There's only two choices. If we can prove that there is other God, he's a liar. If he, if he became a liar, we don't need to believe him. How can you believe the God who lie? Right? So this is where you need to choose.
either you actually make him a liar or he is telling us the truth. One or the other. It's black and white. There's no such thing as a gray area. Maybe. No, there's no such thing as a maybe in this answer. Either you are God or you are one of those gods. I personally, and you have to make that choice as well. I choose he's telling us the truth based on everything what he recorded in the Bible, what I've seen in the history, what I'm experiencing in my life. And he is only God. There is no other God. And now he's actually telling us about interesting story here. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witness neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or a cast an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame. And the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. So, who makes those idol? Men are. Right? They're the one who is actually making the image of a god. Right? So, Iron Man takes the cutting tools and works it over the coals. He fashioned it with the hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and he, his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The car, uh, car, carpetner, uh, carpetner stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with the planes and makes it with the, with the compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man and with the beauty of a man. He dwells in a house. He cuts down cedars and he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and let it grow strong among the trees of a forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourish it. Then it becomes a fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and worms himself. So what he's saying is, he carba, the uh, carpet nurse, is uh, shaping out from the tree. Right? He's uh, shaping out the, uh, the image of a man from the tree, either cypress tree or any other tree that they're actually making the, the image of idol. And then, Whenever they cut off the tree, what do they with the remaining piece of the wood? They burn it to warm it up. So what God is saying it is, what are, you, what, what are you doing with this wood? You're making the image of God an idol, and the rest of the wood, you burn it to warm it up. It's the same tree, right? And he says... Then it becomes a fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire, bakes bread. So he kindles a fire to bake the bread. And he makes a god and worship it. With the, he, he carved it out, right? And he makes an idol and falls down before it. And half of it, he burns it in fire. Over the half, he eats meat. He roasts it and satisfies and he worms himself and say, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, it makes into a god. He's idol and falls down to it and worship it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. So I want you to look at it from God's perspective. Isn't this, isn't this a funny? <laughs> you carve out the image of out of the wood and then you fall down before it is said you're the god and deliver me this is uh this is actually comedy and god looks at the man said what are you doing what on earth are you doing you put all your energy into to this and then making an image of something and you you bow down before it it's the same tree that you made an image of this idol and you burn it and you bake it 
and then you call it a god? What are you doing? Imagine you have a little child, and you gave a Lego to your child, and your child is making a nice, you know,、um, the object, maybe, you know, image of、uh, something, right? And then you, your, your, your child is bow down before the Lego that he or she made, and then, oh. My God! You as a parent, what would you say? It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You you made up this Lego, and you bow down before this Lego, and and then, and you worshiping this Lego. That's a literally what it is. And that's exactly what God is.、Uh, that is what the people of Israel are doing. They know not, nor do they discern, for He has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they that they cannot understand. No one consider, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say half of it. I burn it in the fire. I also bake bread on its coals. I roasted a meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. And he cannot deliver himself, or say, "Is there not a lie in my right hand?" <clears throat> so this is the most silly and foolish things that men were doing, and even today, even today, who makes the idol? Men are. Who bows down before the idol? Men are. We make our own image of God. And we worship those image and praying to those image and saying, "Deliver me, and bless me, give me the peace." And that's what men are doing. It's not only in the ancient time they were doing; even today, they are doing it. And in the future, they're still going to be doing that. How foolish are they? They just do not know who true God is. I asked this question a long time ago. You have your your parents, either your parents passed away or your parents are still alive. I don't know, but I asked this simple question. You speak to your parents. Your dad, your mom. My question is very simple. How do you know that your parents are your parents? How do you know? Well, anyone could bring the foster child and then grow them, right? When they actually bring the foster child, like very young age, and then grow them, and then I say, "I'm your, I'm your dad, I'm your dad, you know, mom." Well, everyone tells them, tells me that you know they're my parents. Well, you believe it, right? So, Daisy, how do you know your parents are your parents? And what what did you tell your parents? Prove it to me that you're my parents.
So do you believe your parents are your parents or, or now? Or are you still questioning them? Mm, I'm not sure my parents are my parents. Are you still scratching your head and trying to figure out your parents are whether you're true parents or not? <laughs> okay. How, how do you believe that your parents are true p your parents? Well, sometimes don't you hear people saying like, oh, your husband or your wife is like, just like you. Don't you hear them? So does that make you, uh, your husband or your wife, make you or your family? The true family line? Similarity doesn't mean anything. So do you believe? So wait, how, well, how do you know your parents are true parents? Oh, is that why? One day, let's like say, you know, like your one day, your your son came to you and said, "Hmm, mom, I don't know whether you're my mom or not. Prove it to me." What would you say? Your son come to you like, "I don't know. I'm not sure. Are you my mom?" What would you say? <laughs> then you probably say you're dead. <laughs> I mean, think about it. We don't really question every day that whether our parents are real, our parents or not. Yeah, just like you know, Daisy said, you know, when she was young, that she was questioning whether, are they my real parents? You know, for what, what they're doing, I'm not sure whether they're my parents or not, right? Some kids may be questioning. But that's just the, you know, moment that you actually have to have, have those questions. But when you look at the, the throughout your life, you always believed your parents are your true parents. What you don't have it is, you don't have the real evidence or proof that you can tell they are your parents, right? You never asked your parent and said, "Dad, Mom, I think we need to go and check it out whether we're actually, uh, you know, we're we're a sibling or not. Let's just go uh, have some DNA test and let, let's get." The full, full, full proof here, right? Then I will know. Once I look at the report, then I will believe that you are my parents. Until that point, I like. I'm not sure. Like, if you, if your if your child says something like that, what would you say? I, I may say, did I feed you something strange food this morning? It's like, what's going on with you? I slap him on his head, like. What are you doing? <laughs> right? I mean, this is some of the things that we don't think about. This is exactly what the Israelites were doing. I'm not sure. Are you, are you uh, my Lord? Are, are you uh, a true creator? Are you, are you sure? That's exactly what the Israelites were doing. Prove it to me. And then they bring all kinds of like 
you know, the adults from their your neighbors and hmm, I think they could be my parents, you know. And how would you feel? Your your son is bring your neighborhood, you know, neighbor is it, and then drag them outside. You know, I, I, they look like me. Like, uh, they may be my parent. I mean, I want you to think about this. I mean, how ridiculous this is. Like, your child is questioning this kind of things. We never questioned our parents are our real parents. You know what? Nowadays, the technology has advanced that we can actually do the DNA test to verify whether, you know, your parents are true parents. But even with that, we don't really go and check this out to confirm that our parents are my real parents. We just believed because they've been telling us that I am their child. Well, I cannot tell whether they're my real parents, but can the parent tell me they're my parents? Can my parents tell me that you're my child? Yeah, I cannot tell whether my parents are real parents, but my parents could tell me whether I am true their child or not. My parents can. can. Because my mother born me and she knows me from the beginning that I was born and raised me I don't know I didn't see it I didn't look at my mom as I was you know coming out of my mother's womb and I said hmm okay my mother looks like this no I don't remember seeing my mother I cannot tell we just believed it because our parents telling me what about God you see, creations cannot tell who is the true creator because we never seen who created us, right? We never seen it. Even Adam did not see it. So then how do we know who is true God? Only creator can tell you are my creations because he made it and he created and he can claim that I am your God but we may say I don't know hmm. maybe this tree or maybe this rock may be the creator then God's going to slap me and I said what are you talking about right it is nothing more than a belief system. Creator could only tell us that He is the Creator and He is the true God. We cannot tell. <clears throat> so we as a human, there is no way can tell who is true God. God is the only one who can tell He is true God. So He or the God is, is the one who can tell me whether I am the creation or not, as I mentioned, he is either lying that he did not create us and then saying he is the creator, which is, this is the greatest lie that the God ever made, or he's really telling us the truth that he is the creator and he is the God is telling us, I am the creator, I am your God. So for us, we only have a one choice. We either believe him as a creator or we don't believe him as a creator. Right? It's very simple. But he's been claiming, I am the God. I am the creator. I created all this heavens and earth. I am your God. There is no other God. Black and white. He either is such a biggest liar or... He, he is truly telling us the truth. It's our choice whether we believe him as he is true God or we don't believe him as true creator 
or God. That's what God is claiming. This is exactly what everyone, including the Israelite and even today's peoples, claiming the same thing. How do you know that you are my God? How do you know that you are a creator? I don't think you are the creator. That's exactly what people are doing. I choose to believe that he is a creator and he is the Lord. Everyone can make their own choice. It's their decision. It's not somebody else's decision. It is your decision. It is my decision to believe. I choose to believe. Not just a, you know believing out of, you know, I think I should believe. No. I actually believed based on a lot of different facts. Thousands of years' histories that he's been telling us over and over, and he proved over and over that he is true God. And I look at every aspect of it, and I experience his existence in my life. And I cannot deny that he is a true God. And it is your choice to believe or deny him, just like the Israelites do. You can believe whatever you want to believe. It's your choice. Unfortunately, God will not force you to believe. God will not. God will not going to twist your arm to believe in him. No, he will not. It's your choice. And he's making strong argument and is very very frustrated telling the Israelites and telling us there is no other God I am the God continue on verse 21 remember these things O Jacob and Israel for you are my servant I formed you you are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Once again, this is another strong statement that he's making. Did Israelite ask the Lord not to forget about them? No. They didn't ask. God is the one who's making this statement. Is that I will not forget about you. It is his zeal. Remember the time... You know, a few weeks back, we, we had this conversation after we had uh, um, some questions about why does God um, um, jealous? Remember that conversation? And we talked about a lot of different things. Let me ask you this. Do you know the difference between jealousy versus zealousy? What's the difference between jealousy versus zealousy? Do you know any difference between the, uh, those two? Anyone? Or you can say, well, well, English is my night, not my first language. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, Tony, you put in, uh, put in the spot, and he turns it off the video. <laughs>
What are, what about other people? Is that the same thing or is it a different thing? Yeah, it's a, a jealousy and a zealousy. Is it is this the same thing or is it different things? It's very difficult to tell, right? Zealousy and jealousy come from the same root. It has the same root. Hebrew word kina is actually jealousy. But at the same time, jealousy has the meaning of a zealousy. How? Let me show you one thing. Let's uh, uh, the uh, let's turn to a second Samuel for a second. Second Samuel. Twenty one. Second Samuel 21, we're going to read verse 2. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. So, Samuel had a zeal for his people. So, he had, he actually killed the Gibeonites because he has a zeal for his own people. So, although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. This zeal is kina. Same word as jealousy. This is the same word. Zealousy, zealousy and jealousy, it's the same word, but zealousy has the positive meaning. Jealousy has a negative meaning. It's the same thing. But whether you see it as a positive way or a negative way. If you look at things from the negative way, it becomes zealousy. If you look at it from the positive way, you, it becomes zealousy. But it's the same word. If you actually look at the actual dictionary of jealousy, you will find it has a two different meaning. I don't know about the Chinese word. I, I, I never actually looked at it in a dictionary, but you could also take a look at it to see what it, what it says in, 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 in uh, you know, Chinese dictionary says whether it has that meaning too. So, God loves... Just like this Israel 
the uh, the Saul loved his people of Judah and Israel, he actually killed the Gibeonites because he loved his own people. Right? I'll take. We'll take a look at the first king again. First king, chapter nineteen. We're going to read from uh, verse 9, 1 King chapter 19, ver uh, 9 and 10. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I even, I, only on, uh, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. What does that mean? What does that mean? Correct. Now some version of the Bible says zealous. Some version of the Bible says jealous. It's the same word. Kina. Exactly same word. That it's been referenced as a jealous. A zealous. Same word. So when do you use it as a zealous and when do you use it as jealous? When my version of the Bible, which is ESV, it used jealous. And NLT version, use it as zealous. Well, if this is a two different word, they shouldn't be actually translated two different words like this. Because that could be completely different meaning. Right? But it's the same word. God loved us so much. He has a zeal for people. If you take it as a negative way, it becomes a jealous. If you take it as a positive way, it is becomes a zealous. God has a zeal for us. Coming back to Isaiah again. <clears throat> so, God is saying, I, I, I formed you, you are my servant, O Israel, you will, be, you will not be forgotten by me. Because he has a zeal for us. I have blotted out your transgression like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I am I have redeemed you. Israelites never asked God to redeem them, but God, because of his zeal, and I will blot out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist, I will blot it out because I love you. They never ask for it, but I love you. Are you do you love your child because your child just, just came to you and begging you, Oh, mom, please love me. Is that why you love your child? Or because of no reason you love your child? Because they are your child. I don't know about you, but I love my child. Because they are my child. Do you treat your neighbor's child as you treat your own child? No, you don't. Why? Because you don't have a zeal for your neighbor's child. 
you don't really care. Right? This is exactly the same thing for God's heart. God loves us and because of his zeal, and I'm going to do this. Whether you're going you're gonna to ask or not, I love you. <clears throat> this goes back to the same thing that we had the conversation a few weeks back. Jesus died for all. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us. But you know what? God cannot force ourselves to believe in that. It is our choice to believe in. So no one can blame God because God died for all of us. It says, Sing, O heaven, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depth of the earth. Break forth into spring on mountains of forest and even tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Though says the Lord, your Redeemer, he claimed himself, I am the Redeemer. I am the Savior. Who formed you from the womb? I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens who spread out the earth by myself. So what is he claiming? I am the creator. There is no other creator. I am the only God who created this earth and heaven. Once again, this is a very bold statement. You may actually read it as, oh, okay, all right, I, I know it. But you know what? God is strongly making this statement. No one can deny it. <clears throat> Like I mentioned, either he's a, such a big liar telling us that he created the earth and heaven. <coughs> Sorry. Even though he did not. Or he truly created the heavens and earth and he's claiming he is the true God. Right? He's actually putting his name on it. He says, Who frustrates the signs of liars and make fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish? We claim ourselves we are, we are very wise and we are intelligent. We figure things out on our, on our own. Imagine, men are very, very intelligent. Men are intelligent compared to any other living things in this earth. All right? We're very intelligent. We develop things. We advanced it. You know, look at the history, how we have evolved ourselves. And we're continue to evolve. And we'll continue to advance ourselves. Things will get better every day, every year, century by centuries. We're going to continue to improve things. Now, by the time our child becomes an adult, we may be actually traveling to, uh, you know, to space, like we're actually traveling, you know, on the, the airplane. Right? We're going to continue to advance ourselves. We're so smart. We developed. Look what we have developed. The man are developed. There's just so much we have developed. But you know what? No matter how smart we are, no matter how intelligent we are, compared to God's wisdom, we can never get near to Him. We can never get near to Him. No matter how smart we just uh, we talk about the you know data lake, right? We talk about this uh, big data, right? Now we're actually competing. The machines are competing against the man's. Right? Feeding more information into it. Even with that information, big data and AI, 
only limited what man has developed. It could only analyze and predict based on the information that it is feed it into the AI machine. We cannot go beyond. And God looks at it. You claim yourself you're smart and wise, and you can determine all this. You're not even near. And that's exactly what he's saying. Who frustrates a sign of liars and make fools of diviners? Who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish? God will make the wisest man on earth. As a foolish man. Who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers? Who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited? And of the city of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Osiris, he is my shepherd, and he, sh he shall fulfill all my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Remember, God actually gave this prophecy to Isaiah, and Isaiah spoke to the Israelites. And he mentioned the name Cyrus. Who is a Cyrus? Cyrus is the king of Persia. Right? He's the one who destroyed the Babylonian Empire. God gave this prophecy to Isaiah even before the rise of the Babylon. So Babylon existed, but Babylon did not destroy Israel yet. So let's take a look at some things here. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, look at the. this data all right I'm gonna share my screen you see my screen well you have seen this table you know many times in the past so when did Isaiah act as prophets when you look at the actually very beginning of the Isaiah, it actually talks about what he, what time that he actually worked. You know, so when you look at the Isaiah chapter one and verse one says the the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. So when did he uh, act as Isaiah? Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and as a matter of fact, he died at the time of uh, the reign of Manasseh. Manasseh is the one who killed Isaiah. According, to, uh, it's not in the Bible, but according to the historical uh, artifact of Israel, Manasseh actually killed Isaiah with cut him in the saw, cut him with the saw. That's how he killed Isaiah. So, he worked from the time somewhere between B.C. 767 and somewhere between 687 and 767. Okay? So, when did Babylon destroy the Judah? 
When was the fall of Judah? BC 586. BC 586 is when the fall of Judah. So when you scroll down, you see at the bottom Judah into Babylonian captivity, 586. This is the fall of Judah. Then when did Persian Cyrus destroy e d the Babylonian Empire? Does anyone know? BC 538. BC 538 is the when Cyrus destroyed the Babylonian. And BC 536, that's when Cyrus proclaimed to go back to Jerusalem. So let's take a look at the Second、um, um, Chronicle. Second Chronicle, chapter.、Um, 36. Second Chronicle chapter 36. We're going to read from verse 22. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord has stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So that he made a, proclama a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Though says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of, all,、uh, uh, of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house, of, house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. This is the proclamation s that Cyrus made after he freed up Judah from the hands of Babylonia. This, is, this proclama proclamation was made in BC 538. And when they returned to Jerusalem, that was the BC 536. And then that's when they started to build the, the second temple. So let's just do the simple math. We don't know exactly when this, which year that Isaiah was actually giving this prophecy when we're reading this chapter 44. Let's assume from the time that he was actually acting as a prophet and the time when Cyrus appeared in the history. To free up and gave the freedoms to the Israelites, BC 538, there is a, about 150 years gap from the time when Isaiah gave this prophecy that Cyrus will come and he will free up and we will build, rebuild the temple. That was 150 years before he was born. His name was spelled out 150 years before he was born. Once again, I mentioned when Isaiah was giving this prophecy, this is before the Babylon destroyed the Judah. So this is like after Babylonians. Invaded into Jerusalem, right? And then brought everyone as a captivity. And then later on, less than 100 years, Persian now invaded into Babylon and destroyed the Babylonian Empire and free up the people of Judah. So this is way, way before. He was born. Imagine. 
Someone said 150 years before that there will be a, a man named Key will be born and he will be actually giving the, uh, you know, uh, Bible sharings. 150 years ago. Before I was even born. Will I be amazed? If someone actually gave that kind of a prophecy, I'll be amazed. Wow. My name was actually, you know, came out as a prophecy 150 years ago. Well, Isaiah didn't see it. Right? Isaiah never seen Babylonian actually came down and destroyed destroy the, uh, the, the Jerusalem, nor Cyrus to free up the Israelites. He never seen it because he died before that. Because he died, you know, the time of uh, the uh, Manasseh. He never even seen his own prophecy was fulfilled. We did because we know this is a history. Once again, Bible is about promise. He's making promise and he's fulfilling it. How do we know that he is true God? Because he's been promising and fulfills it, promising, fulfills it, and he's been doing that for thousands of years. That's how we know that his promise will be fulfilled in the future. Because of the history that I know. I'm not just a believing because he said so, because he proved himself that his words are truthful. So, when people heard of this name Cyrus, no one cared nor understood the prophecy that Isaiah was giving. Because, first of all, he didn't know the Persia will be the one who will be destroying Babylon. Because at the time, Assyrian were the strongest country of all. They're the one who's ruling the world in the Middle East. So Isaiah didn't even think that Babylon is the one who's going to destroy the Assyrian. Because at the time, no one ever believed any country will overpower the Assyrian Empire. But this was a prophecy. This is why nobody believed in him. Who cares? 150 years ago? Imagine. When Cyrus came to Babylon and destroyed the Babylon, at the time, who was there to meet or greet Cyrus. It was Daniel. Daniel was there to greet Cyrus when he actually invaded into Babylon. I am sure Daniel gave that prophecy. Your name was a prophesied by the Lord. That you will come and destroy the Babylon. I'm sure he was amazed. My name was spelled out 150 years ago by one of your prophets? Obviously, Daniel was not a you know easy person to just talk about these. And he was the master of all the masteries. Of Babylon. Right? And I'm sure Cyrus took it to his heart and amazed by that prophecy that was given 150 years ago. His name was spelled out, and not only his name was spelled out, what he will do was already spelled out. That's one of the things that God is doing. He's approving over and over and over throughout the Bibles and, and, and matches with the history as an artifact that his promise will be fulfilled. Even with that, we don't believe. 
And I told you before, many people, oh, that's just the history. Remember, remember one thing I mentioned to everyone. We are seeing, we are seeing the prophecy was fulfilled in our own eyes today. That is, when Israel came back together as a one country, in back in 1948, no one ever believed that Israel will come back together as a one country again. After 2,500 years ago that disappeared. This country, ever since Babylon destroyed the Jerusalem, right? In what year? B.C. what? 586? And when they actually came back together as a one country, when was that? 1948? So what's the gap between that time and the time when Israel came back together? How many years have passed? Two thousand. I told you before. Have you ever heard of any country that disappeared two thousand years ago and reappear again, and and speak the same language and and have the same belief and you know the customs and cultures the same? Have you ever heard of the country or people? Besides Israel in human history? None. If there is, show me if there is. You argue that with any historian, no one will dare to even fight for that. Because there isn't. We are seeing that history. We are seeing that God's promise will, was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Um, 2,000 years after. And even after God has shown that amazing things, do people believe? <laughs> no. <laughs> even though they have seen this promise been fulfilled, people still don't believe. So, this is what it's saying. It doesn't matter what God showed. People still don't believe because their hearts are hardened by themselves. They don't believe. They always asking, show me more. Give me more proof so that I can believe. What more proof do you need? God has shown so many miracles and wonders throughout the human history. What else do you need to see? And people say, well, I have not seen it. Well, if you see it, do you think you're going to believe and your descendants going to believe? No. It's the same story over and over again. Only selected people will believe, unfortunately. This is why I said it is up to us to believe or deny. Coming back. So, let's say, verse 27. Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. You probably don't understand what this means. You have to understand the history of, of what happened when Cyrus actually invaded into Babylon. Um, if you... If you're interested in uh, if you're interested in the uh, mm, the ancient history, I would say um, when Cyrus came to Babylon, Babylon was a very very strong fortress, and no one ever imagined that anyone could actually, you know, um, destroy the Babylon. Their fortress was built so uh, what 
what's the word that I'm looking for, is well designed. And their wall is so thick that on top of the wall, they, they're like four, um, um, what you might call the uh, the carriage you can with the the horses can ride on that the top of the wall, and the walls are uh, double walled, so the wall after another walls, and on top of that, surrounding the area of the the fortress, uh, there is a moat. You know what moat is? There's like waters. Uh, yeah, the waters uh, surrounded the the fortress. That that the, the the door has to actually come down to just to make the bridge to go into the uh, to the, um, the uh, to the city. So there is a waters flowing around those fortresses, so no one can come near to the the fortress. And when Cyrus was actually coming to attack the uh, Babylon, he was riding uh, a cabin's with the four white horses. He was riding four pure white horses, right, on the carriage. And he was showing himself like he's the king, right? When he attacked the Babylon, he, as he was coming from the Persia, Persia was a small country at the time. And back then, it was a media was the biggest country. It was overruling the uh, areas. And he took down the Medians at the time. And the first attack was the Median. And as a matter of fact, the, the Median was actually over, uh, was, was ruled by his grandfather. And grandfather did not want the, the Cyrus to really just, you know, do anything with it. So he actually, you know, sent them over to a small country. And then later on, he gained the power and then he overpowered his grandfather and took over the media. And when he did that, the second things that he did was that he was invading into Babylon. Everybody was uh, laughing at him. Because you actually, you know, you, the Cyrus, have overtaken the media was amazing things. This is like the news of the century that you actually took over the media. But just because you took over the media doesn't mean that you can actually you know, win this battles with the Babylon because no one can ever dare to fight over Babylon at the time. And no one believed that anyone can actually penetrate into the, the Babylonian fortress. But as I mentioned, he was riding four ho white horses on the carriage and then he was like showing off like, ah, oh, I am the king. I am the like, you know, the king of this world. And he was actually riding nicely. But while he was crossing the river, one of the horse drowned. One of the, out of the four horses, one horse drowned in the river while he was crossing the river. And he was so furious and mad because it's like this. Like, you know, one day you were actually, you know, going over to a party and you actually wore the tuxedo with the nice you know, the, the bow ties and things that nature's. And then as you are going to a party, you're actually the, 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 uh, uh, one side of the, you know, your, your, your blazer got ripped off. You ruined. You're going to really show off that, you know, how nicely you dressed up, but you, your shoulder got torn like you're so upset because now your plan is like ruined, right? Because your image is not going to be as good as you thought you it's going to it's going to be. So you're upset. Same thing. He was trying to show off with the riding four white horses, you know, invaded into a Babylon and show off that he's the king of the king. One of the horse got drowned. So he was furious and he was very upset. So he actually ordered his his soldiers as a I'm so mad, I want you to just like block this river. So what he did was he put the, um, the uh, sand over the river and he split the rivers in 12 different pieces. 
because the river was dried up, the river that is supposed to go to the moat into the Babylonian fortress got dried up. Because of that, the entrance entrance was appeared. That's how Cyrus got into the Babylonian fortress to take down the Babylon Empire. This is the history. I'm not making this up. This, you can read in the, the ancient history. This is exactly what is written in the history. This part, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your river. This is exactly what Cyrus did when he take down the Babylonian Empire. Because God actually used the Cyrus to dry up the river to attack the Babylon. So when you actually go to uh, Daniel for a second, Daniel chapter um, 5. Daniel chapter 5. Um, he talks about the uh, Belshazzar's story. And he was actually having a banquet with his, um, his mans, right? And so when you look at the chapter 5 at the beginning, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lord and drank wine in the front of the, uh, front of the thousand. So he was actually having a, a good time with his, uh, his people, right? And then Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of Silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple of Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they uh, brought in the golden, uh, golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lord, his wives, and his concubine drank from them. They drank wine and praised the god of uh, gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stones. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the a plaster of the walls of the king's palace opposed, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw, hand as it wrote, then the king's color changed, and he thought alarmed him. His limb gave away, and his knee knocked it together and the king called aloudly to bring in the enchanters and chaldeans and the astro astrager the king declared to the wise men of babylon whoever reads this writing and show me in its interpretation shall be uh, clothed with purples and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third rulers in the kingdom so he actually saw this actually you know the hands are coming out and wrote on the walls, and he what he was wondering what that what that means. So later on, Daniel came out and actually interpreted what that means, right? And at the end, so look at the verse twenty nine. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and proclamations was made about him that he sh should be the third rulers in the kingdom. That, not, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. He was killed by who? Cyrus. And Darius, the Media, uh, Mede, um, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This Darius, it, he, he is the actually the Cyrus's uncle, which he invaded together, and he actually had the Darius to rule the Babylons uh, for a little while because he was old. So that very night, when he saw 
the hands was coming out of the nowhere. He wrote on the wall, on the posters, and you know, t- you know, telling him that he's done. His time is over. Right? This is exactly what happened. This is the year of BC 338. I mean, not 300, 538, I'm saying. So, this was all prophesied all beforehand and says, coming back to Isaiah verse 28, chapter 44, verse uh, 28, who says of Osiris, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose. What will Cyrus do? He's going to release the people of Judah. And he will fulfill the God's purpose. In saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Which means after Cyrus released the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem. So there were a lot of Israelites was living in Babylon. And when Cyrus took over the Babylon Empire, he released the Israelites, go back and build your temple. And when the Israelites was, you know, the order to go back to his own, uh, their own country and to city to rebuild the temple, Cyrus supplied all the materials, money, everything that they need to rebuild the temple. This is exactly what he's saying. She shall be built and the temple, your foundation shall be laid because of the Cyrus. So God used the Cyrus to fulfill his purpose and his plan. Now, today we don't have time to really go over chapter 45, but 45 talks about what God will do through Cyrus. And this is going to be interesting topics to talk about next week, but at least you know that this is all prophesied way, way before that no one understood what God will do. But for us, luckily, we have seen this in history and it was a fulfilled. So that for us, and a beneficial. Because when we were born, this was all done and then recorded in a human history so that we can actually go back and read what happened. And what God said was a fulfilled. All right, so I'm going to actually just to cover up to chapter 44 this week, and then we're going to continue on chapter 45 next week. Any questions about the things that we cover today? Correct. So from your perspective, you don't care because you're not going to see it, right? Yeah, for you it is not. But it is not. But you know what? Your descendants will. God is going to actually do this because of what you have done. This is what I will do. So, because he prophesies, no one can deny it. Right? Because this is like way, way before this happened, God already prophesies what will happen. So, how many times God has prophesied that this will happen and then he actually showed that it's really happened at their time? Did they believe? No, they didn't. Even though he actually had done in the time they can see, they still didn't believe. He actually tried to actually prophesy way before the time. They still don't believe. Well, either way, they don't believe. But no one can deny. Like for, our, for, for us, we cannot deny what he prophesies will be fulfilled. Like for example, God says that throughout the entire the Old Testament said, I am going to bring you back wherever you are. 
ends of the earth, I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. Well, at the time when this prophecy was, a, it was a spoken, no one believed it, no one cared. When was this fulfilled? Thousands of years later. They're not going to see it. So then prophecy is useless? Not necessarily. Because we have seen it. God's message and prophecies, and not only for the people at the time, but for people who will see and cannot deny. Because we always find the excuses not to believe. Does it answer your question? There are many. When you think about it, when you think about it, a lot of the prophecy is actually written in the Revelation hasn't been fulfilled. And and then on top of that, well, here, here's the thing. I don't know whether we're going to see the ends of the earth. We may, we may not. I don't know. One thing I do know is it's not going to be another thousands of years. We're living at the very near end time. We just don't know whether we're going to see it in our time or are going to be after our time. And for my personal view, my personal view is I may see it. I may see it in my time. I don't know. But it's just my is my view based on what I am seeing in this world. But I could be wrong. Well, he also said, we look at the sky and when their clouds are coming, we know it is going to rain soon. Right? So God said, you will know the signs. And, and it, he mentions about, you don't know exact date, but you will know something is coming towards you. We don't know exactly what time it's going to rain, but we know it is going to rain very soon. Exactly. Well, that's why I said I I may see it. I don't know. I can't be, you know, I can't promise that I will see it, but based on what I'm seeing, there's a good possibility that I might see it. Because at the time when Isaiah was giving this prophecy, no one believed that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Same thing. We think, oh, what are you talking about ends of the earth? No, it's not going to happen. We never know. But if someone comes to you and says, well, such such year and such such month and such such date, well, you know that that's not true. Because the Bible says you don't know that date. Even Jesus said, I don't know the date. <laughs> Any other question? <laughs> 